Hello everyone and welcome to another mini sky tonight. So one of the questions I sometimes get in the planetarium is, are there aliens? Is there life beyond our planet? So I decided to kind of dive deep into that because it's a whole big realm of study. It's called astrobiology. It's the study of life beyond our planet. So let's kind of dive into the, some of the basics of what do we define as life, simple versus complex, how do we organize life, and what does life need in order to be able to have life beyond our planet. And then next time we can talk about the difference between like intelligent life versus basic life and so on, because many people want to say, have something like ET to be able to communicate with. So we need to kind of dive first into some of the basics, and then we'll get into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence study. So the concept of life beyond our planet isn't new. In fact, the ancient Babylonians believed that there had existed life in the ether of some kind. But today in our modern culture, the idea of having these unique creatures and beings that exist in different planets and different climates and different biomes is not new. I mean, all these different movies per portray different types of aliens out there. So what does it mean to be a life form and how do we define life here on our planet? So what do scientists think of life beyond our planet? Why not? I mean, if the conditions are right and everything is great, there's a good chance you can find life. And I mean, if you look at our own planet, we have such a wide diversity of different animals and organisms and such that it's possible that we can see different types of life beyond our planet. And not to mention there's other possibilities for life to exist. But we have to look at some of the basics. Now, many people think, oh, we're looking for little green men that can communicate with us through some type of men or medium. When in actuality, scientists look at the broad picture. We look at simple versus complex, simple life forms. So the idea that a simple life form could exist on another planet is pretty good. Whereas in a complex life form, that starts to get more into tricky territory. So. When I talk about simple life forms, as you can see in these pictures, a simple life form is you're basically your little microbes. Whereas in a complex organism, it's like us, humans. I mean, there's over a hundred different types of muscles in your own body. It's crazy, and not to, that doesn't include like your bone structure, it doesn't include your nervous system, it doesn't include all the different types of muscles that are working in your body, it doesn't explain your, how your brain works and everything, it's just, it's crazy. All the different parts of your body, so that our human body is rather complex. So let's break down to what we define as life. I mean, we have a diversity here on Earth, so we can say something's alive and something's not, but how do we know? So let's look at what is life and how do we define life? First of all, it has to be ordinary. It just can't be just some random blob or some random gas of some kind. It has to have an order. It has to have a structure of some kind and often it's symmetrical in some sort of fashion. Next step, Reproduction. Now, I don't know about you, I have yet to meet an immortal type of organism that exists on our own planet, or one that exists for several hundreds of years. Many organisms have a finite lifespan. So how do they continue on their species? How do they keep going on? Because if it dies off, that's the last of it. And we have sadly experienced extinctions here on our planet. So how does a life form continue on? Well, in the terms of simple cells, many of them go through the process known as mitosis, where it gains energy and that energy allows it to be able to split into two different atoms, not two different, uh, two identical atoms. So basically it keeps splitting and then those split and those split and so on. For example, your skin cells do this very, very well, where it gains energy from your body and that energy then causes it to go through the process of mitosis where it keeps splitting and splitting and get creating new skin cells. So that way, that's how cuts on your arm and things of that nature heal. It's because your body's constantly producing more skin cells that you're able to heal up faster. 
Now for complex organisms, most of the time it's through offspring, whether it's laying eggs, whether it's producing little, little ones, they create some type of offspring that is a production of two of the same species of animals that then continue on and create more of that individual animal. So what about viruses? I mean, here we are in kind of this COVID-ness and many people ask, is this a living entity? Well, believe it or not, it's a very big debate in biology because many people don't know if it is alive or it's not. And it, in fact, you can leave your discussion down in the comments below whether you think it's alive or not. I personally think they're special. And here's why. Viruses cannot survive on their own. They have to have a host. In order to be able for it to reproduce, it literally hijacks a cell, forces its DNA into a natural pre-producing cell, and then it reproduces copies of itself by hijacking a naturally producing cell. It cannot produce on its own. So therefore it has to hijack something that naturally pre-produces. And that's why people are highly debate whether it's a virus or not because they said, well, in, in order to have like an offspring, you have to have two individual components come together. Maybe it's adding a component, but sometimes a virus, like a flu virus, is hijacking your body by taking the white blood cells and hijacking the white blood cell, which produces through mitosis. So hence why I said special, very special. And like I said, you can leave your personal opinion down in the comments below whether you think they're a living organism or not. Next up, energy transfer. It's the ability to absorb, use, and produce energy from your surrounding environment, whether it's eating, bathing, doing stuff, photosynthesis, and the such. Basically, you're taking energy, absorbing it, and using it to do something or and or producing type of energy. In the case of plants, it's photosynth photosynthesis, where you take light and light from the sun and produce some type of organism or you produce some type of flower or you produce something. It's basically means of taking energy from the planet and, you, and producing some energy. Next step, environment. All life needs a place to live. We have our homes that we've sadly been kind of quarantined to. Life has its own unique type of environment and you need the right conditions in order to thrive. Fortunately for here on earth, we have a wide diversity of different environments. So hence why we have such a wide diversity of different creatures. And a creature from the desert is not gonna be able to live in the ocean. And the same with an animal from the tundra isn't gonna be able to live out in the plains. They are suited for their particular environment. Last step is adaptation. Because our planet changes and our environment changes, we have to change with it. Now, yes, it can start getting into the realms of Darwinian evolution, so to say, but think of it in terms of a basic level too. For example, human clothes. You're not going to wear something in the summertime that you would wear in the wintertime. So you're not gonna wear shorts in the middle of the winter, even though there's some people that do that. I honestly think they're crazy, but you're not going to wear something lightweight during the winter time when it's bitterly cold or else you start getting frostbite or hypothermia. And the same thing goes with the summertime. You're not going to wear a ski parka in the middle of a hundred degree heat. You'll overheat. So you naturally adapt to the environment and you, your clothes change as you adapt to the weather conditions. Um, I mean, heck, we're having to adapt to this new environment called quarantine, having to adapt our lives from going face to face to now we're here virtual. So we're learning to adapt. And even your pets and animals do this naturally, whether they get a summer coat because they naturally shed some of their fur to deal with the warmer climates and it starts to build up more and more as it starts getting colder. So I mentioned dinosaurs dying in my presentation because Dinosaurs were very hard to adapt. They were huge creatures, and since they were such huge creatures, adaptation for them was very hard. They had a specific environment with specific temperatures with a specific type of area that they needed to have. Plus, they had to have a specific type of food. In fact, there was one particular species of dinosaurs that literally could only eat another type of dinosaur. That's it. It could not eat any other type of dinosaur. 
And as this other type of dinosaur died out and or migrated and moved on, this other species of dinosaur started to slowly die out. Whereas in mammals, they had such a wider palate, they were able to eat different things. So now that we define what is a life, let's figure out how we organize things because we have such a wide diversity on our own planet. We need to kind of create the system that be, allows us to be able to organize life specifically. In biology, this is called the uh, biological train, or sometimes it's called the kingdom train, but I've, call, I've heard it called different names, but call it what you will. Chances are you'll probably come across it in your biology class. So the first step is called domain. The first step of organizing all these different types of life forms is domain. Is it simple? Is it complex? The next step is kingdom. Is it an animal? Is it a plant? Is it a bacteria? Is it a fungi? Is it a protus? So you're taking simple versus complex. Now I'm going down one train of the biological train. It's a huge, gigantic web. So I recommend looking at a textbook to see how it goes. The next step is phylum. Is it a vertebrate, invertebrate, warm-blooded, segmented, and so on? Next step, class. Is it a mammal? Is it a bird? Is it a fish? And so on. Last step, order. Where does it get its energy from? Does it eat plants? Does it eat meat? Does it eat, do photosynthesis and so on? Next up is family. Basically, it talks about like the previous ancestor of this particular animal. Like where did it all start? Like the grandpappy of all this different type of animal. Next up is genius. Genus, which then they separate from this original ancestor, different kind of like like you have your great, 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 great grandfather, and then it separates out into the different families. And the next step is species, that particular animal. So that's the biological tree of life and how it's organized. So a, a good mnemonic that I sometimes use to be able to remember all the different steps of this family tree is deer kangaroos present child on game shows, which talks about Again, going back, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So if you remember the mnemonic, that'll help a lot remembering the different steps. So let's look at an example, a wolf. For example, it's in the domain Eukarya. It's a complex cell organism. It's in the kingdom Animalia. It's an animal. It's in the phylum Chordata, which basically means it has a, a, a skeletal structure that allows it to have a tail. It's in the class Mammalia. It's a mammal. It's in the order Carnivora because it eats meat. Family Canidae because it's a part of the Canis species or Canis genus. So the Canidae is the original granddaddy of this particular wolf. Canis, which is canine, which then that particular family separated out into this different genus. And the specific species of a wolf is Lucas. Now, you may be thinking, okay, why does it have all these weird Latin names? Well, Latin was a common language that was used in biology to give a specific type of animal. I honestly think it would be easier just to do something different, but Latin is the basics for all of it. So now that we've looked at life and how we define it and how we organize it, let's look into the, pos the prospect of life beyond our planet. That is the study of astrobiology. Now, astrobiology is not just simply astronomy and biology. No, 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 no. It's a whole new realm. It's biology plus astrophysics plus geology plus planetary science plus heliophysics. So what are those things? Biology, the study of life. Astrophysics, the study of our universe. Geology, the study of our planet. Planetary science, how planets are formed and how they evolve. Heliophysics, the study of our sun. All of that combined together to figure out is the study of the origin, evolution, and distribution of life in our universe. So now that we talked about astrobiology, what does life need in order for us to be able to detect it? According to astrobiology, these are some of the building blocks that are necessary in order to have life on any type of planet. The first step, carbon. Carbon life form is 
the most abundant life form. I mean, you even look at here, often many life forms here are carbon formed. Hence why we have the term carbon dating and such for different types of organisms that have died. Because carbon easily bonds with other elements to create protein chains. And whereas in, there's possibility for silicon uh, life forms because silicon easily bonds with other elements, but not as easily as carbon. Carbon is able to uh, produce different types of chains. In fact, I think they've produced at least 76 different types of chains of proteins, whereas in silicon can only do about 24. So not very many different types of organisms can be created with silicon. So hence why we look for carbon. And carbon is a mo very abundant element in our universe. Next step, water. It, the reason being why we talk about water, yes, there are plants that don't necessarily need water, but water in general on a planet is necessary because it's a liquid at reasonable temperatures. Now, many types of elements on the periodic table can either be only are a gas at room temperature or frozen or solid at a room temperature and or switch between these different elements or di the element switches between different states given at very such a small range of temperatures. Whereas in water, when it gets close to roughly 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it's frozen. When it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it becomes a gas and it's a liquid in between those different stages. So that means liquid is a water is a very tenacious liquid and it also has what is known as capillary action it basically encapsulates itself if it's on its own you can kind of see that like in the image right there it basically naturally wants to form into droplets like on that beautiful spider web it's ph neutral and it has no charge many liquids usually are either too acidic or too basic whereas in water is relatively neutral and it flows easily some liquids have a lot of what is called viscosity, so it's very thick, kind of like syrup, whereas in water, easily flows. So that's why scientists believe that water is necessary for a planet because it's such a good mixer of different chemicals. And of course, my personal opinion is because without water, there's no coffee, and right now we all depend upon coffee. Next thing is energy source. Where can life on this particular brand new planet get its energy? Is there sunlight? Is there chemical? Is there gravitational? Is there internal heat? Does there food? Can life get energy from something? Because if it's just a dead rock, well then it's just a dead rock. You have to have something for this life to be able to gain its energy from. And last but not least, a stable environment. You have to have conditions just right that don't go from extreme hot to extreme cold within a second and or all of a sudden a planet decides to ram into another planet and then there goes your chance of life. You need to have a stable environment to be able for life to thrive. So in the case for many types of life forms on different planets, you need a planet that's in the habitable zone in order to get liquid water. Not too hot where it boils up, not too cold where it freezes over, just right. And it stays in that habitable zone. Now, we have to talk about some weird cases too, because now most life usually has to have a unique environment and a stable environment and stays in that particular environment. There are some strange cases even here on Earth, and we're discovering more and more unique strange cases where they've survived in the most weirdest conditions that most life wouldn't. For example, the image on your right is known as the water bear. It has been out in space. It got hijacked up into the International Space Station and it dehydrated, and they were able to put a little bit of water on it and it went about its business and it's perfectly fine. Yeah crazy. So it's, it, it survived the vacuum of space and was able to still thrive. And then you have underwater thermal vents, which are some of the most harshest conditions in terms of chemical and temperatures. On the inside, it's like 200 degrees Fahrenheit of the thermal vent, but on the outside, it's near freezing because it's near the bottom of the ocean. 
but there's organisms they saw like these little organisms like phytoplankton almost that went in and out of the thermal vents like it was nothing they, it just went in and out so you could have some weird different types of life forms that exist in some weird conditions so that's something to take into consideration too so now that we talked about what life needs let's look for a planet Fortunately, the chances of finding a planet are really good because to date, given all the different satellites that have been looking for planets and everything and some of the unique technologies we've been able to use to find planets, we have found over 4,000 different planets around other stars. And that's only within our what I've called our solar neighborhood, like some of the few hundred nearest stars to us. So the possibility of other planets in our galaxy is pretty large. In fact, scientists estimate that nearly half of the stars in our galaxy have a planet of some kind. So that's where we can start beginning our search. So is it possible for a microbe to exist on one of these random planets? Possibly. But of course many people want to know the next step of life like us. So we'll talk about that in another future video. But if you have any other topics you would like for me to cover over, leave it down in the comments below. If there's a question you would love to have answered, leave it down in the comments as well, and I would be more than happy to answer it. Also, parents, if you're interested in activities for your kids, futurereadysa.org has an amazing site that allows you to have fun activities for your kids to do at home and still engage them intellectually while they're having to sit around at home a lot. So think of it as basically learning about our universe in your own home and having fun with it. Who doesn't like to have fun while learning? So I'll leave a link in the description below of how you can be able to gain access to the one badge that I was able to help work with. It's called the Astronomy Plus badge. And there's some fun astronomy activities that you can engage with your kids. So until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, Never stop learning.